we're up. Okay, welcome back. Wonderful day again. Non-raining for a change. Uh, the course surveys are out today, as I just mentioned. Also a non-handout, which is a page that was accidentally left out of the sample final that got handed out last time. So if you didn't get a copy of that wonderful pipeline diagrams, please do that. Um, any questions or comments? Remember the final review tomorrow? Question? Um, 10 to 12, yes. Um, will there be any solutions to the uh, the last homework, the one we weren't supposed to turn in? Uh, they, there were solutions, and they were already sent out. So oh. you should have gotten them. Oh, OK. So they were with the stuff on Tuesday? Yes. Oh, OK. Anything else? OK. Last time, we were doing a quick flyover of multiprocessors and networks, or um, we're trying to do that, and um, had gotten to the point of trying to design a multiprocessor, uh, and for efficiency reasons, of course, wanted each processor to have a cache memory so that it could get quick access to data, and then uh, realized that we have a little problem, because if each of the processors has data which may be modified in its own private cache, then the other processors are not going to see that data. So we have a cache coherency problem, or a cache consistency problem. And we need to solve it somehow in order to make these multiprocessors work. Now notice that this is not the first time we've had this problem. In fact, this problem occurs even in uniprocessors, if it's not a multiprocessor, for I.O. accesses. Because I.O. accesses may not be going through the cache. And they may be depositing data, which the CPU won't see, or reading data, which the CPU has modified, and they won't see. But we can handle it in other ways. It's relatively rare. We can, we can do software tricks, because we know when the I.O. is going to happen, uh, to solve the problem by not caching the data, by flushing the cache at the appropriate times, uh, and deal with it basically in software, occasionally with some hardware assist. But for multiple processors, we can't do that, because we don't know what programs the other processor is executing necessarily. We don't know when it's making access to data. So we've, we've got to prob handle the problem in a efficient fashion somehow in, in hardware. Now, you can always decide that some data is private, that if it belongs only to one processor, um, you don't have to solve the problem because the other processors will never reference the data. But for shared data, um, we do have the problem. And there really are two kinds of problems. One is that when one processor writes the data, that eventually it has to be seen by the other processor. Now, exactly what eventually means, uh, we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, you certainly can't expect every time you write a value on one processor and read a value on the other processor that the second processor is going to see the correct value because you don't know the rate at which these two processors are running. They're executing at different speeds. Uh, one may be later or earlier with respect to the other. But what we'd like to do is that eventually, which is to say relatively soon compared to the rate at which uh, um, programs run, um, something written by one processor is seen by the other processor, even if it's cached in both processors. The other thing is that we want writes to the same location always to be same, seen in the same order. Uh, we don't want to have write after write hazards um, that are written by one processor or seen by the, the other processor. So to solve these problems, we have coherency algorithms. And basically, there are two different schemes. One of them, the so-called Snoopy scheme, Sno Snoopy algorithms, takes advantage of the fact that in a bus-oriented multiprocessor, all of the transactions between the caches and memories are seen on the bus. Um, and if that's the case, then all of the processors can watch all of the transactions, even if it's not something that they're doing, and see if it affects the data that they have in their private, ca their private cache. So let's look at these uh, Snoopy protocols. The main problem is, what do you do when data changes? Obviously, if the data is not changing, there's no problem. Everybody uses a cache just to make it go faster, and they have the private copies of the same shared data. But as soon as one of the processors writes, then you've got to do one of two things. Either you've got to tell everybody else who has a copy of that data that their data is invalid, and that this, that's this write invalidate scheme. Or you've got to update their cache with the recent value so that they have access to the more recent data. And both of these are usable. Uh, the write invalidate scheme tends to be somewhat more 
efficient uh, when a given processor is going to be using a word for a while. Because once you broadcast a single write and validate, then um, you can continue to write to that word, if you've got the right kind of cache coherency, without having to uh, broadcast any additional information to other processors. If you do a write update, then every time you update that word, you know, if it's a loop counter or something, every time you write it, you're going to have to broadcast that updated value to all the other processors. Um, these can work with write-through or write-back caches. Um, write-back is uh, more common because you don't want to keep uh, accessing main memory on the common bus to uh, update main memory every time you do a write to the cache. On the other hand, write back is the scheme that causes more problems with this cache coherence because it means that there's updated data in the cache which doesn't appear in main memory. So the trick now is that you've got to broadcast special commands on the bus that everybody sees when data is um, being changed. And for each cache line, we used to have a bit that said that it was valid in our cache and a bit that said it was dirty in our cache. We have to now add a new bit that said it was shared in our cache. And we have three different states that any cache line can be in a private cache. And we move among those states as our processor accesses memory. But we also move among those states as we see other processors access the same data. So here's a simplified version of a state diagram for a line in our private cache. We start out with that line being invalid because we haven't read anything into that cache line. So we do a CPU read. And here, notice that in these state transitions, there are two kinds of operations. Operations that are done by us, that's the CPU, and operations that we notice going on on the bus, that's these bus operations. So if we do a read, we fill up our cache line, we put that cache line into the shared state because we have read it. There may be other people that have read it, and we all have the same copy of the same data. As long as we continue to do reads, then um, we stay in the shared state. As soon as we do a write, then we have to move to another state that says we are the exclusive owners of this data. And we have to um, say something on the bus so that anybody else that has a shared copy of that data basically dumps his shared copy, invalidates his copy, because we are now the exclusive owners of that data. So when you're in this state, you should be the only one in this state for that particular cache data. When you're in this state, then you can, then multiple processors can be in the state for that same cache data at the same time. So you can follow around the, the state diagram. Notice, for example, that if we are in the shared state and we see on the bus some broadcast by somebody else that says that they're writing that data and they've done a write miss, they want it in their cache for their private use, then we have to invalidate the data in our cache because um, they're going to be modifying it and our shared value will be incorrect. The next chart shows in a little more detail the transaction, the Question. transitions uh, between these various states. Question? Yeah. Question. Could you show me how, you, how, you, how do you get from the exclusive? You get a CPU read miss out of the exclusive? How, how does that happen? Um, what, uh, let's see if I can remember what this was. We're in the exclusive state, so we own the data. And, um, we are doing a read miss. That's um, probably another CPU. Well, if it were another CPU, it would be a bus. I can understand this one, right? If, if another CPU is trying to read the data that we exclusively own, then we'll see on the bus a read miss transaction, and we have to write back the data, and then we can keep it in our cache in a shared sense, um, but we can't be exclusive owners to it. If we see on the bus, if we own it and we see on the bus another processor trying to write it, then we have to dump it out to main memory and it becomes invalid because we're not the uh, exclusive owner of it anymore. If uh, we do a read miss, I guess I'm at a loss for at a moment for what this was. Maybe... Well, a follow-up on that is what, how did things get flushed from the cache in general once you're out of room in the cache? Oh, they get flushed from the cache in the normal way. I mean, if it's a write-back cache. 
Uh, the line may be replaced. Maybe that's what this was meant to be. That read replacement, yeah, that could be a, like a line replacement in the cache. That's right. It could be a line replacement in the cache. But why does it become read only? Oh, um, okay. Now I am beginning to understand. This line in the cache is changing its data. We had a line which we exclusively owned. It has to get dumped out of the cache because we need that line for something else. So uh, it's a read miss that causes us to write that line out. We now read into the cache a new line of different data that we're sharing because it's a read miss. Thank you. <laughs> that was it. OK, this is uh, still simplified, but in more detail what happens as you go from state to state. And notice that based on the current state, trigger events can be things that we're doing, reading or writing to cache lines, things that we're seeing on the bus, write misses or read misses, and then we take some action, which might be dumping change data out to memory and to the bus, and then uh, change to our new state. Notice that if somebody else is doing, for example, a read miss, and we have exclusive control of that data, we have to write the data to memory. We also have to write the data to the bus in time for the guy who's reading it to read it. So the data is being supplied by us uh, in a sense simultaneously to the memory and to the processor that's executing the read miss. Again, I, I'm uh, not expecting you to understand all of the gory details of these algorithms, but just to get a flavor of um, what kinds of things are needed to be done and, um, and that you can convince yourself that they might work. Um, in fact, this particular three-state uh, scheme for doing cache coherency is too simple, more simple than it um, needs to be for efficient implementation. And there are lots and lots of uh, proposed elaborations of these um, schemes. Um, in particular, uh, one that most of the current processors um, implement is something called the, the messy algorithm, standing for modify, exclusive, shared, or invalid. It adds one additional state. And it allows a, a, a processor to have exclusive ownership of a block, even if it's not modified. And once you have exclusive ownership, then when you modify that block, you don't have to do bus broadcasts, because you know the, you're the only one that, that, uh, that has it. So um, I, I think the book actually goes over the, the, the messy algorithm um, and shows some of the state transitions from one to the other. Pentium uses this. The PowerPC 601 uses it. It's one of the several optional cache coherency algorithms that uh, the R4000 can use. Any questions? Those are the Snoopy protocols. Um, that works well in a scheme where it's a multiprocessor, which is basically in a small box, where every processor can be connected to the bus and see everything that's going on at the same time. As the number of processors gets larger and their connection becomes perhaps not bus-oriented, uh, those protocols break down. They don't scale anymore. So the alternative to doing that are these directory-based schemes, where instead of um, broadcasting or snooping on uh, every transaction that goes on on the bus, you keep a directory, which is with the memory that has state information about each memory line. And for one thing, you uh, need to know whether it's uncached, which means uh, nobody has it in their private cache. It might be shared by a whole collection of processors, or it might be exclusively owned by a single processor. And you need to send around messages between or among um, processors and memory to keep this information up to date as, as processors go through memory references. Now, one of the problems is that this has uh, generally higher overhead, because the overhead may be proportional to the memory size, not to the cache size. For each memory line, um, you have to at least keep a bit that says this is uncached in any of the, the caches. There are uh, proposals and implementations of the scheme that try to reduce the amount of overhead just to, in fact, a single bit, so that um, when it begins to be cached, then some of that state information about who has it cached um, is in the cache itself rather than in the memory system or is in a separate data structure part of the memory system. But basically, you've got to keep some information about each memory, and you've got to keep information about all of the processors that have a copy of it uh, in the case that it's being shared. 
so that if it moves from being shared to being exclusively owned, that you can notify all of the, those processors that their data is now invalid. So one way you might consider doing that is having a bit vector of processors with each line in the cache or each block in the cache to identify which processors currently own that data. That doesn't scale very well either. And in, if we get uh, toward the end to talk about uh, SCI, the Scalable Coherent Interface, which is a shared memory scheme um, using a kind of directory-based algorithm, it in fact uses a linked list that links all of the information through the cache in order to keep track of which processors are currently owning the memory. It again is a non-bus scheme, so it can't use the, the Snoopy-based protocols, which are the easiest ones, but the ones that don't scale. Seems like on the Snoopy protocol you're going to have a lot less network traffic, is that true? A lot less network traffic? Yeah, fewer In the messages. Snoopy protocol, everybody's got to watch all of the transactions between cache and memory. But there are fewer of them, right? Well, every time you do a cache miss, there's one of them. Right? So, so there's a lot of traffic going on on the bus between memory and caches that, have, that, that all of the processors have to watch. If you, if you now not have a bus, don't have a bus scheme, but have some kind of a network where you'd have to transmit that information throughout the network, you wind up with a lot more traffic going on if you try to duplicate the Snoopy protocol in a, in a network scheme, which is, why it, which is why it doesn't work, which is why you want to go to other schemes like directory-based schemes or the, or the linked list schemes. In fact, the, the next um, chart shows the kinds of messages that get um, sent around from processor to cache and from cache to cache to try to keep the data consistent. For example, if a processor does a read miss, then it basically has to send a message from the processor to the directory giving um, its processor number and the address of the data it wants. And then the directory, or the cache, can update the bit vector indicating that this processor is now a shared user of this data and send the data back. So there might be a return message after this read miss that says, Here's the data return from the directory uh, to one of the caches. Um, that, that's the data that, that you wanted. Now, if that data happened to have been shared by other users and you wanted to write it, let's say that you did a write miss to the cache, you're still sending the processor number and the address, then the cache has to now invalidate other users of that data. And I guess it, in that case would send an invalidate message to all of the remote caches which are currently listed as users of that data to tell them to invalidate their shared copy because somebody else is trying to write it. In the case where somebody else is uh, an exclusive owner of it, then you might want to tell them to fetch and invalidate, which is please return the copy of data that you may have modified because you were the exclusive owner back to memory and remove it from your cache because somebody else now wants to become the exclusive owner of this data. So basically, this tends to be more memory-centered in the sense that the caches themselves become active participants in this exchange and keep track of who owns their data and, and um, well, rather the directories do, of who owns their data and uh, sends appropriate messages out to invalidate uh, people who it knows has copies. Notice there is a place now where you record who owns the copies, unlike the Snoopy algorithm where everybody uh, knows for itself whether it has a copy, but there's no global place that keeps that information. This is a more centralized kind of algorithm. Okay, that uh, solves in two minutes the <laughs> cache coherency problem. There is another class of problems that multiprocessors have, and that has to do with the need for synchronization. You've got to have some way to have shared access to data in a way that one person can, one person, one processor can look at it and modify it for a while, and then another processor can look at it and modify it for a while, and that's the, the mutual exclusion problem. You probably have seen this kind of thing for um, multitasking systems within a single processor. And the, the obvious software approach for handling this in a, in a unit processor where you're multitasking is some kind of a spin lock. You want to get exclusive access to some data structure. So there is a flag, we'll call it locked, which says um, whether or not somebody has exclusive access. 
So while somebody has exclusive access, you just do nothing and wait for them eventually to give it up. Right? When they've given it up, you set the lock to one that says you now own it. You do whatever private manipulation you want to do with that um, data, and then when you're done, you unlock it. While you're in here, somebody else who comes along and looks at that lock will find it set and wait around until you're finished. So it's a way to guarantee mutual exclusion. Now this works on a uniprocessor, provided you disable for interrupts in the appropriate place. And you might want to think for yourself about where in here you need to disable interrupts in order to um, get this to work correctly. In fact, as I've written it in this C style code, it's not quite obvious because really the disable has to be sort of in the middle of this statement. But this won't work when it's a multiprocessor because both of the multiprocessors, because their instructions are being interleaved and there are no disables, might check the locked flag. They'll both find it set to zero, so they both executed this instruction. And then they're about to both execute that instruction. So even with cache coherency, they'll both see the lock at zero. They'll both set the lock to lock the one at one, and they'll both be in this code modifying the data at the same time. That obviously, is not going to work. The solution to this problem is to have some kind of an atomic primitive, of which there are many examples, that retrieves and changes a value simultaneously, or, or which is to say, uh, without any opportunity for another processor to get in in between the fetch and the store. And the, the simplest one is a straightforward exchange, which exchanges um, two variables or a variable in a, in, a, in a register and returns to you the, the previous value. So if I wanted to do a mutual exclusion lock that works in multiple processors, I can set a temporary variable to one. That's the variable I want to put into the lock. And then I exchange that with the lock. And what this does is return to me in temp the old value of the lock. If the old value was one, that means somebody else had it. I set it to one, but that's OK. It was already one. But it means somebody else had it, so I can't get it. So I keep doing this over and over again until I do the exchange. And finally, the old value was zero, and I've set it to one. Since I've set it to one, I can uh, go in, do my private stuff, and then unlock the lock. This works OK, but in order for it to work, it at least requires uh, cache coherency. But we solved that problem. So, so we now, if, if you have this kind of atomic primitive, have a way to have multiple processors synchronize on the use of a shared resource. Um, there are lots of these primitives. Uh, each machine designed to do multiprocessing, which all current microprocessors are, by the way, have some combination of these uh, uh, sets of instructions. More or less, they're all equivalent. There are details. In many cases, you can build uh, some of them out of others of them. Um, and, and I won't attempt to explain how they all work and what the, the differences are. There may well be performance issues. Uh, in particular, depending on the kind of cache coherence algorithm you've chosen, um, waiting around for access into one of these locked structures can cause a lot of memory traffic. Because, for example, each one of those exchange attempts tries to do a write. So it may be doing uh, broadcasts for exclusive control. If you know that your cache coherence algorithm is going to cause that kind of memory traffic for each attempt, you can optimize it. You can, for example, test the lock first to see if, it's, if anybody has it. Um, and if nobody has it, then you try to do the, do the exchange. So you can, you, there are ways, fairly simple ways, of trying to improve the performance uh, in the case where the cache coherence is going to be a problem. In any case, this doesn't solve, doesn't scale terribly well for hundreds of thousands of processors. Imagine a case where you've got a thousand processors all trying to grab control of this lock by doing exchange operations at the same time. And for one thing, you have a hard time guaranteeing fairness, You're guaranteeing that eventually every processor will have a fair share at getting that lock. In which case, you need a different style of lock, a, a lock that basically allows you to make a request, queue a request onto that lock, and then have it satisfied later in some predefined order. Now, an interesting question that leads into another issue is um, whether, in fact, you can solve the synchronization problem without having uh, those kind of hardware primitives. And it turns out that there is a software-only algorithm that does it. It's called the, the Decker algorithm. And um, 
it allows you to get by without hardware primitives, but it requires a specific kind of ordering of memory accesses among multiple processors. And um, I don't want to go through this in great detail, but let, let me point out a couple of features. One is that a lock now has three different components. Instead of just being a single word that says locked or not locked, um, it might have three variables, even in the case where there are just two primitives competing for it. One says that I'm trying to lock it. The other says that he's trying to lock it. And the third says whose turn it is to lock it. So basically what happens is that I try to lock it. I check to see if he's got it locked. If so, then I can't lock it. So if it's not my turn, then I unlock it. And I wait for it to become my turn. And then I lock it and do my stuff. You need to stare at this for a while to convince yourself that, in, in fact, in all possibilities of interactions between the two different processors, uh, that this is safe. Um, it, it may not guarantee fairness. You may be always locked out, um, but at least it guarantees uh, safeness and consistency. But one of the things it requires, and I'll talk about what this means in a second, is, is strong ordering of memory accesses. It requires a model as if there were a single memory system uh, and all of the accesses to memory occurred in the order in which they were executed by processors. Now this doesn't say anything about which processor is faster or slower or which one gets to do something first. I mean all it says is that if processor one is doing a sequence of reads and writes to the same or different instructions and processor two is doing a sequence of reads or writes to the same or different instructions, it means that Processor 2 will see this write before it sees this write. Um, it means that processor 1 will uh, guarantee that this write has been done before this read has been done, that they're done in the sequence in which they occur in the individual processors, uh, and are completed in memory in that order. But it doesn't say how these things are aligned with one another. That we can't guarantee but because they're independent processors. It also doesn't say how many of these operations can occur in between two operations of the other processor. All it says is that as things are sent to memory, they are executed in that order. That sounds trivial, but in fact it's not. If you consider um, this simple case of two processors executing data, which are independent of one another, this processor executes a store of some location, puts a new value in. This processor executes a store and puts a new value in. And then each of those processors executes, uh, loads the other guy's new value. Question is, is it ever possible for both processors to get old values? And think about it. There are only really three different cases. If this guy executes all the way through, he does his store followed by his load, and then he goes through, and certainly this guy is going to get this guy's new value. Right? Similarly, the other way around. If both of them do their stores at the same time, the memory sees both of them those stores, then they'll both get the new value from the other guy. The only way, and in fact on a uniprocessor, if these are two different tasks, and they're not disabled for interrupts, and they're executing in whatever order the time sharing or the, the tasking system wants them to execute, it's not possible in any sequence in which these instructions are ordered for both processors to get the old value. But in a multiprocessor that doesn't obey this kind of strong ordering, then it is possible because this store might be delayed until sometime over there. This store might be delayed until sometime over there as seen by this processor because we've got a cache coherency algorithm in progress. And it may be sending messages from main memory to caches um, and those messages get there a little bit later. So in fact, both of these processors might do the store, both of these processors might do the load, and then both of the pieces of memory might get updated. If you do something like that, if you allow um, that to happen, then in fact, even algorithms like the Decker algorithm won't work to guarantee synchronization. I have a question. Yeah. Um, before you said on load link and uh, exchange instructions, those things don't scale well to hundreds or thousands of processors. Right. 
Um, is it because the hardware implementation doesn't scale well, or because the, it doesn't scale well for 1,000 processes rather than processors? It doesn't scale well for 1,000 processes. It's the same problem if you have a single processor and are trying to get mutual exclusion. And in fact, in mo most operating systems, they have some kind of queuing locks in order to do it. So it's but not the multiple processors necessarily. OK, so it's not a hardware problem. No, it's not specifically a hardware problem. So if a processor, if you design a multiprocessor and you obey this sequential consistency or strong ordering so that this can never happen, uh, then you could run the Decker algorithm. Um, right? Memory operations are done in the order in which instructions are executed. The problem is that, as we've seen, with most reasonable cache consistency algorithms, you can't guarantee that. So in fact, you want to have a uh, weaker definition of what it means for data to go to memory um, to allow more efficient implementation of cache coherency algorithms. That means you've got to avoid using things like the Decker algorithm for, for consistency. Decker's algorithm is one example of a program that, that fails um, if you don't have strong ordering. There are other examples. But as long as programs are synchronized using some kind of lock, and you've solved the problem of doing locks with using these special hardware exchange problems, uh, then most other programs won't have Decker algorithm-like flaws. They won't fail. Um, because if they were to fail, um, if, if you don't have locks, then chances are they would fail for other reasons, because um, they're allowing the two, two different processes to access data without a kind of mutual exclusion guarding. So if, if programs are synchronized, then um, they generally don't require strong ordering. And we don't need strong ordering for mutual exclusion, the Decker algorithm, because we can get away with using hardware uh, exchange operations. Um, so it allows us to, you, to, to build a multiprocessor, in fact, that has less than strong ordering. Uh, and there are um, several different other ordering constraints that people have allowed uh, that allows higher efficiency, basically, in exchange for more and more sloppiness in the way that memory operations are eventually executed. The, the first one is this total store ordering. Basically, total store ordering allows uh, the kind of thing that I showed on the previous graph, that writes are delayed until later reads. It's not the case that they occur in the order that they would if everything were going to one memory, where a write would occur and then a read would occur later. We're going to allow writes to be delayed with respect to loads that occur later. Right? It allows us, for example, to have write buffers, which is a great thing, as we know, for um, efficiency, but allows write buffers on one processor to, write to, to be storing data that the other processors won't see yet. So, most processors, um, current microprocessors, that uh, are allowed to be connected into multiprocessor um, configurations guarantee only this total store ordering. They don't guarantee the strong ordering. Now, you can relax it even more than that. You can, for example, go to the next level, which is partial store ordering. Um, it allows writes to be delayed, as in total store ordering. It also allows writes to be executed out of order. Right? That allows, for example, this cache coherency stuff to be going on in any order. If it's one of these distributed cache coherency algorithms, it allows the updates to occur in whatever order uh, happens in the network or whatever order it's chosen to be most efficient without being concerned that it was the order in which the data was originally written uh, in, in program order. Now, once you've done that, you've opened the barn door, so to speak, to allow all sorts of programs that you would might expect to work correctly to fail. And if your processor supports partial store order, uh, there are lots of places where you've got to be careful. One place is in releasing a mutual exclusion lock. Right? The way we had on the previous slide to release a mutual exclusion lock is simply to set the lock equal to zero after you've done all of the updates to to the private data structure that you've got the lock for. Um, 
if you've got total store ordering or, or strong ordering, that works just fine because all of those writes are finished by the time you set the lock to zero, and nobody else is going to access that stuff until the lock is set to zero. But if you have only partial store ordering, then some of the updates to this data structure might get delayed until after this lock gets set to zero, in which case somebody else could grab the lock, set it to one, get exclusive access to that data structure, and not see the last change that you made to that data structure. This is one of many examples of programs that look right that fail uh, if the partial store ordering is used. The way that processors tend to deal with that uh, is uh, one example is, is what Spark does, and it allows you to insert a instruction at a at a particularly vulnerable point that temporarily uh, resynchronizes in a certain way that allows um, allows you to guarantee the correctness of the of the execution. So they have a, a membar instruction, for example, that says, at this point, I want to guarantee that all previous stores will complete before all subsequent stores are allowed to execute. And if you insert this memory barrier instruction between the end of access to a critical section and the store which releases access to that critical section, then you've made this correct. And in the Spark, I believe, you get to choose on a page-by-page -page basis what uh, store ordering you want to allow for that particular page. So if you've chosen a partial store ordering for this code, and you have a sequence like this, then you or the compiler has, has to, have to put in the appropriate memory barriers to um, get the, the uh, algorithm to work correctly. The, the next step down is sort of um, any order you like, relaxed store ordering. Um, basically, there aren't any ordering constraints on reads and writes to main memory, uh, reads with respect to reads or writes with respect to writes. Now, obviously, the uniprocessor self-consistency rules still have to take effect. If I write a, a memory location from a register and a subsequent instruction on my processor reads that memory location, that's got to work right. And my programs on a uniprocessor have to be consistent. But no other guarantees are made. And the Spark allows this, um, uh, again, I, I think on a page-by-page -page basis, but then has, in fact, a complete set of memory barrier instructions that allow you to guarantee ordering of stores with respect to subsequent stores, stores with respect to subsequent loads, and, and the other combinations as well. In fact, this is a single instruction that allows you to set bits within it that indicate which instructions are to be synchronized or, or sequenced with respect to which other instructions. The advantage of doing this is that it allows uh, more processor or multiprocessor efficiency and memory efficiency by delaying the access of loads and store and load and store instructions. Um, but you've got to be very careful about writing code that works in a multiprocessor environment. Any questions? That's everything about multiprocessors. <laughs> if, um, again, this is only uh, taste of the icing, so to speak. If, if you're interested in this stuff, there are other special purpose courses that talk about multiprocessors in great detail. Um, or you can read papers on your own. The textbook uh, goes into more detail than I have in some of these subjects. Um, what I'd like to do now is uh, teach you all there is to know about networks in um, a half an hour. <laughs> so um, now on to something completely different. And really what I'm going to do is, rather than try to go over a kind of general taxonomy of what different kind of networks there are and, and uh, be relatively abstract, I'm going to be relatively specific, which is to say to look in um, uh, small detail at a few networks, um, two networks which are classics and are probably near the end of their lifetime, the Ethernet and token ring and two networks which are brand new and are probably at the beginning of their lifetime. And in the case of SCR, it's not clear whether it's going to have any lifetime at all, but it's, uh, it's an interesting approach. Basically, the scheme, the idea here is still to try to make multiprocessors in one fashion or another, trying to link together multiple computers into a, a cooperatively shared environment um, to be able to do things together. Now, sometimes it's to share data um, on a relatively distant 
fashion, you know, they might be able to share a file, and then sometime it, sometimes it's in fact to build a very closely coupled multiprocessor, and that's what SCI tries to do, and, and uh, make a machine that is a shared memory multiprocessor out of what really looks like networks. But the first approach is the distant approach, which is you take computers which are entirely independent and try to make them connected in some way that they can share data. And it's no more than trying to connect them with modems and phone lines, except you want them to go faster. And the, the prototypical version of this is Ethernet. It's a shared bus system. It's like a backplane system for an individual computer, in the sense that there's one piece of copper wire that all of the computers are connected to, and there's only one transaction that's flowing over that wire at a given time. And the original Ethernet was a kind of unwieldy, uh, very thick uh, coaxial cable with a two-part scheme of having a transceiver that was clamped to the cable and connected by another cable to the um, computer. And there was a relatively limited ability for these um, segments to be connected to each other. You could connect three of them together before you had to use a computer in between to actually uh, forward packets from one to the other. Um, it got standardized, um, and it got standardized in, in various um, variations over the years. Uh, but the key aspect of this is that there's a single wire. Everybody's connected to that wire. Everybody sees what's going on at the same time. And somehow everybody has got to agree on a scheme for sending information on that wire that doesn't interfere with the other people who want to do the same thing at the same time. This is what's on the wire. It's a packet. Uh, it has a preamble. Now remember that anybody can be a transmitter, and everybody's got a clock that's going at a slightly different rate. So as you move from one transmitter to the other, you've got to do something that allows the receivers to synchronize their clock with the new transmitter. So one of the sort I think this is six bytes actually one of the sources of overhead in Ethernet is the fact that on this one wire there can be multiple transmitters at different times so you've got to have this overhead that allows receivers to synchronize their clock and then it's a packet of data which is you know, up to 1500 bytes it includes at the beginning of it an address of who it is the data is going to and an address of who it is the data came from and uh, some check information at the end to verify that the data didn't uh, arrive correctly at the destination. Now remember, everybody is seeing this packet at the same time. So uh, the destination address is sort of for your information only. If you happen to be the guy whose destination address matches, then this data is probably for you. But everybody else sees that packet at the same time, which is good because it allows you to do broadcasts. It allows you to uh, include a specific destination that means anybody or everybody is supposed to look at this data because it means something useful for everybody. TCP IP was built assuming that the network could do this kind of facility to broadcast to all stations. And as we'll see, if, as you go into networks that don't allow that because they're not a shared bus system, like ATM, implementing TCP IP on a system like ATM uh, that doesn't have broadcasts is a much more difficult problem. How is it that the multiple stations on this network get to decide um, who to send? Well, the big breakthrough in Ethernet uh, is the so-called CSMA-CD, Carrier Sense Multiple Access Collision Detect. Basically, it means you listen on the wire, and if nobody else is currently sending a packet, you send a packet. And you sort of keep your fingers crossed and s hope that nobody else has done the same thing at the same time. Every once in a while, that's going to happen. Every once in a while, there are going to be two or more people who listen on the wire simultaneously, determine that nobody is sending, and both try to send at the same time. So the collision detect part of Ethernet says that if you are sending a packet and you detect that somebody else is sending a packet at the same time, in fact, in Ethernet, you do that by looking at the electrical signals uh, on the wire, then both of you abort the transmission. In fact, you, you pollute your packets to make sure that anybody who is in the process of receiving them is guaranteed to get bad data. But then you stop, and you generate a random number that says how long you should wait before trying again. And you hope that the other guy generates a different random number, and you'll try first, or the other guy will try first. If you keep colliding over and over again, then in fact there's a scheme for saying that every time you collide and wait 
for a period of time to try again, you wait a longer period of time. That's this binary exponential back off. Every time you collide, you wait twice as much on the average that you, that, than you did before uh, to, to uh, try again. And, and if there are multiple people trying to send, the effect of this is to spread them out in time. So eventually you'll find one guy who tries and nobody else is trying at the same time. Problem is uh, that you wind up wasting a bunch of bandwidth on collision. And how much you waste depends, obviously, on how many people are trying to transmit at the same time. It also depends on how big the packets are you're sending. Um, collisions are detected relatively early, um, so that if you're sending very long packets, then the fraction of bandwidth that you wind up wasting because of collisions, which occur early in the packet, is smaller. So the delivered bandwidth of this network gets better, increases, as the average packet size of net, uh, transmitted on the network increases. Problem is that most people who have done uh, studies of packet sizes discover that uh, most packets are short. In fact, the average packet size is something like 200 bytes, uh, and the most frequent packet size might be something like 128 bytes. So you know, on real networks, the collision overhead for an Ethernet kind of carrier sense multiple access can be relatively large. The other problem is that it turns out that the software overhead to send these packets often tends to dominate by far the time it actually takes to send the packet. You can spend 200 microseconds on each end of a sender and receiver of overhead trying to get through the software to process these packets for a packet that only sent 100 microseconds to send. So you've got a, a 6 to 1 time expansion here uh, for or inefficiency caused by the software overhead. Because this is a packet-based, non-shared memory scheme, some of the networks like SCI try to get around this by essentially reducing the software overhead to the overhead of a single load or store instruction, rather than to the overhead of creating a TCP-style packet. Question. Yeah. I think the preamble is 8 byte long. I think the preamble is 8 byte long? That's what I originally wrote. I thought I'd remembered it being 48 bits, but it's one or the other. <laughs> There's also a delay in between packets. There's a required delay at the end of the CRC of about 10 microseconds before the next guy can start the next preamble. Now, there have been lots of variations of Ethernet, and the more variations they are, the less Ethernet-like they become. It turns out that having one piece of wire that gets strung around a building going from computer to computer, even if you change from that unwieldy thick wire to thin wire, is very unmanageable. And a more manageable scheme, in terms of reliability and changes and so forth, is to, in fact, wire all of the computer back to computers back to some hub. So uh, most, many of the ethernets that get installed these days are not a single wire scheme physically. They're, in fact, a centralized scheme where the wires from each computer go back to a hub, and in the hub there may be this single wire where all the collisions are occurring and so forth. And then somebody noticed that, well, if I've got all of these things going back into the hub, why is it that these computers can't talk to each other at the same time that these computers are talking to each other? Because the hub can be smart and realize that that's the intended traffic, and break this thing into two parts and have more total throughput going on uh, by having multiple conversations at once. In fact, a lot of these so-called switched ethernets now do that. They have multiple collision domains. They allow groups, either dynamically or statically, to be uh, associated with one another and not um, allow simultaneous transmissions between them, but allow simultaneous transmissions between other groups. Or in fact, a single computer can be a collision domain, in which case I would claim this is not an ethernet at all. It's basically a hub, which is a big switch that connects a source to its intended destination, and you can get n over 2 simultaneous um, conversations in progress at the same time. In fact, what makes this be Ethernet is that the standards that the computer obeys is Ethernet-like, even though what's going on in the wire, so to speak, or in the hub, is not Ethernet-like at all. Uh, what goes on in a switched Ethernet hub is much more like what goes on in ATM than what goes than than the original Ethernet uh, scheme. <coughs>
Now IBM, in the mid-80s, who remember doesn't like anything random associated with their computer, really didn't like this idea of a random amount of time that it takes to get access to an Ethernet network and a binary exponential back off, and the idea that there are no guarantees that a specific computer will ever get access to the network. They wanted a scheme which was much more deterministic. So in the mid-80s, they um, got standardized a token ring network, which is uh, different in the sense that Instead of having one wire that everybody fights for, there's a ring of wires uh, that threads its way through each of the computers. Each one of these is a separate computer. And packets make their way in serial fashion from one computer to another and then back to the original computer in a, in a logical ring. In fact, IBM had recognized that that kind of distributed wiring is, is a nightmare to install and maintain. So physically, it's wired like the hub-based Ethernets. There's a, a cable from every computer to a central unit. But in fact, in the prototypical uh, token ring, that central unit is a passive box that has nothing but switches and relays in it that allows all of these computers to look as if they're on a uh, common circular ring. The delay through each of these networks, through each of these computers, is very small. It's something like three bits. So in fact, the latency of a packet going from one station to another is um, quite small. It's much less than the size of a packet. And what they do to, all, to control access to this uh, ring is to send tiny little mini packets from one station to another that they, that's called the token that represents your permission to send a packet on the network. And this is what tokens and packets look like. A token is a little three-byte gadget. It's got a start delimiter and some bits that say this is a token and an end delimiter. And when nothing else is ha happening on the ring, this token is circulating at 16 megabits per second from station to station around that ring. When any station wants to send, it reads in the start limiter and the bits that say that this is a token, but outputs on the ring instead a packet. That looks sort of like an Ethernet packet. It's got a destination and a source and a bunch of data and a CRC and some other control bits. But this packet then starts making its way around the network. People always draw pictures of the token ring as if a packet is on the ring going from station to station. But in fact, that's a very misleading picture. Remember I said the delay through each station is only three bits. The size of the packet is much larger than the size of the ring. So in fact, what's really happening is that one station is beginning to send out this packet on the ring, that the beginning part of the packet threads its way through all of the stations on the ring comes back to the station that is generating the packet, and it has to start absorbing it at the same time that it's sending out the later bits of that same packet. So there's one frame being sent on the ring at a time, and that frame is much bigger than the ring and is being removed as it's being sent by the transmitter of that packet. Can a token ring work with the token tacked onto the front of the packet instead of the end? Uh, there is no packet tacked onto the front. A token tacked onto the front of the packet. Um, instead of a token, you've sent a packet. And there's a bit in here saying, this is not a token, this is a packet. Did that answer the question? Basically, a, a, a station, when it wants to transmit, waits until it gets the token. It changes that token into a packet. That packet makes its way around the network when that packet has entirely been absorbed by the transmitting station, then it emits a token again. Did that help? I hope so. Now, one of the big advantages of the token ring is that you now have deterministically guaranteed that you can get access. You can, you can define a maximum latency, maximum amount of time that any particular station will have to wait to get control of the network, which is basically the worst case of every other station on the network transmitting exactly one packet. And um, for people who think that deterministic uh, access is important, then token rings are their bag.
Now, both Token Ring and Ethernet share a common problem, which is that they don't scale to thousands of nodes, because anything that has a single shared interconnect just doesn't work that way. Uh, the phone company figured this out in the 1920s when they eventually gave up party lines. And you need some kind of an interconnect which is based on a more flexible switching fabric. And, and people talk about it as a cloud, where you try, in fact, not to specify the details of how this interconnect works, but rather try to specify the details of the connection between a node or a computer and the rest of the interconnect, or uh, the connection between within the interconnect of two switching nodes uh, that are used to relay the packets or messages from one node to the other, but not try to constrain the interconnect to being either a single bus like Ethernet or a single ring like token ring. There are two different approaches that are very different for using this same kind of model for building big, in, big networks that scale to thousands or tens of thousands of nodes. One of them is this so-called ATM, asynchronous transfer mode, which is a WAN-like network. So it's coming from the uh, wide area network world, and in fact was proposed originally by the telephone companies um, and has uh, gradually been uh, co-opted or taken over by the computer communications world. And it's still a scheme which people think can be used for both worlds, WANs and LANs. SCI is coming from the other side. It came from people who were designing multiprocessors. And in fact, these the people who designed the, the latest future bus spec are the people who designed SCI. And their idea was to expand outward from very tightly coupled multiprocessors to a scheme which can also be used for LANs. So they're coming from the bus world into LANs, and ATM is coming from the WAN world into LANs. And they both wind up with a LAN-like scheme that solves similar problems in very different ways. ATM is a traditional long-haul network in the sense that they expect in Ethernet style that what you're passing from station to station is a message. It's a packet, you're running AT, uh, TCP, or you're running some other kind of packetized protocol that exchanges information in big clumps. SCI is a shared memory model. When it's all done with, SCI looks like a bunch of computers connected together sharing one gigantic memory, even though these may be 60,000 computers separated by uh, 3,000 miles. If you want to send a piece of information to another computer, you do a store instruction. There's no packetizing. There's no software overhead. You store into a memory address that represents his memory. OK, so five minutes on each of ATM and SCI. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> um, ATM is point to point, uh, so it's not like Ethernet, there's nothing that's, uh, no piece of copper that's shared. It's, it's one node to another node or to another switching uh, element. It sets up permanent circuits. So if you are a computer and you want to be talking, exchanging packets to another computer through this switching fabric that may be hundreds of computers and spread over thousands of miles, you do something in advance that sets up a link between you and them, you and it, and you instruct all of the things inside this switching fabric that you're going to set up that connection. And from then on, you just give the identifier of that connection when you want to send a message. So that instead of identifying all of the hundreds of thousands of bees that you might be talking to, you say that, I want to send a message to my 25th connection. And that'll get through this network and eventually get to B. That's a permanent virtual circuit. The Things that are getting sent from node to node are fixed length cells. They're 48 byte cells. And this was the result of a big fight between the telephony people and the LAN people. The telephony people wanted this to be as small as possible. They were proposing 16 bytes. And their problem was that they wanted the latency to be as small as possible. These are, by and large, store and forward nodes. Right? We talked about store and forward. Um, the smaller the packet size, the smaller the latency as a s packet makes its way through a store and forward network from one end to the other. The telephone companies wanted to m absolutely minimize the latency in order to avoid echo problems. They want to use this for real telephones. 
And if the delay is too long from one end to the other, then uh, there's too much of an echo in the phone from one side to the other. It makes it difficult to talk to the person on the other side. The data communications people, on the other hand, wanted the packets to be as large as possible, knowing that they were interested in high throughput and that the smaller the packets, the larger the overhead and the lower the throughput. So they fought for a while uh, and compromised between 32 bytes and 64 bytes on 48 bytes. And in fact, the cell size is 53 bytes. So there's a, a relatively large overhead of about 10% for every one of these fixed length cells. On the other hand, these cells are processed and switched entirely in hardware so that there's very little software overhead in addition to the, the hardware overhead or the transmission overhead. So it's not as bad as this would be if Ethernet were designed to be 48 byte uh, package. Um, I think I don't want to talk any more about that. Uh, just give you give you a feeling of what the ATM cell looks like. There are 48 bytes of data. There is information that describes which channel or which connection, remember this is a connection-oriented scheme that I'm sending this packet on. Uh, that's what this stuff is in here. And then a type that says what kind of data this is. There's an error correcting byte that applies only to the header and it's up to higher level protocols to worry about whether or not the data got there correctly. And there's a lot of uh, discussion going on now about how it is with this kind of a format you can embed on top of this TCP IP like packets. There are several problems. One is that 48 bytes isn't big enough, so you've got to have some scheme for collecting together multiple ATM um, packets to make an Ethernet packet. A more serious problem is that ATM does not have a broadcast scheme. This is a network, after all, which may have 100,000 nodes connected to it. It's unreasonable for everyone who tries to establish a connection to expect to do so by broadcasting uh, an IP packet in order to do that. So there has to be another way to solve the problems that TCP IP solved by having access to broadcast. And uh, that's a serious problem. People are proposing schemes to solve it. Um, I think I will skip over the rest of ATM and talk briefly about SCI. Now SCI is like ATM in the sense that it's point to point. Uh, the big difference is that this is a shared memory model, where in order to um, communicate with other processors, you do primitive instructions like load and store. And you can communicate with any of the processors in the network, which in this case is limited to 64,000. Um, it also has a fixed packet size. Uh, the packet size is something like 16 or 32 bytes. Um, all of the information, the only information that needs to be in this packet, remember, is information about where it's going to, what address in that other guy's memory you're trying to access, and the data, if it's a, a read versus a write. All of this, all this network is trying to do is simulate distributed memory in a fashion that has cache coherency in, in the way that we saw before. Um, SCI uh, actually is a hybrid between a ring-like scheme and a point-to-point-like scheme, which they've done in a very clever way that I wish I had time to talk about, but I don't. But the memory space that uh, ATM provides to a single processor is really very simple. It's a 64-bit address. 16 of those bits say which node you're trying to talk to. 48 of those bits say within that node, which has a whole bunch of private memory of its own, this is the byte of memory that I want to get to. So it's a simple, flat address space where you can address up to 64,000 nodes and two to the 48 pieces of information within that node. Um, I guess the really interesting part of SCI is how it does cache coherency. I'm skipping forward a bunch of uh, slides. Um, basically what it does is to try to maintain a linked list of all of the CPUs that own it. Uh, 
So there may be a memory module here, which is the final repository, the ultimate location for a piece of data. And that memory module may be with one of these CPUs. But all of the CPUs that have shared access to this data may have cached that information. So you've got to somehow keep track of which CPUs have shared copies of that data. And it does that by having a linked list. Within the cache of any CPU, you've got to have a little data structure with every line that says, um, in fact, it's a doubly linked list that says, who's the previous guy on my list that has a copy of this data? And who's the next guy on my list that has a copy of this data? And if in this case, four processors are sharing that data, there's a linked list of four items. Uh, the head of that linked list is in memory, in fact. If somebody else, an additional CPU, wants to get access to that data, it does a load instruction, say, to this memory. That load instruction represents a little packet that gets sent over the network that says, I want access to this memory. The memory module might then send back a piece of information saying, OK, here's the data that you asked for. But you should now set up your linked list so that the next guy in your linked list is CPU A. So if CPU X now has read that data, it has a linked list that points to CPU A. And the memory module now has a linked list that points to processor X. So as load and store packets are sent around this network, this linked list representing ownership of the cache data continually gets updated. And then when somebody tries to modify a piece of data, that piece of data can be uh, either written to all of the CPUs that currently own it, or they can be sent messages saying that that data is now invalid, they should remove it from their cache, and this link, uh, linked list basically is disassembled. Um, this is a very different way of building multiprocessors. has extremely uh, low latency compared even to uh, schemes like ATM. It's a very software-friendly kind of way of building systems because it's a shared memory scheme. You can take a problem which is solvable on a uniprocessor with multiple tasks and run it on a distributed system using SCI simply by distributing across multiple processors. And wherever tasks would have been reading or writing shared data, it will work in uh, an SCI distributed multiprocessor. If you're interested in this stuff, there are other courses, as I mentioned. There are lots of uh, current papers being published about uh, SCI. There are um, seminars going on. In fact, next week, it may even be during the break, there's a uh, workshop going on in uh, Santa Clara University on SCI. And if anybody is interested in going to that, come to me, and I can probably arrange to get you some free access to that. It's been great fun. Thank you. Uh, please fill out the survey forms. I can certainly uh, use the feedback. I'll need a volunteer to get those back to the office next door because they don't trust professors to do that. So uh, somebody please volunteer to get them back. Good luck. Bye.